الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Can you guys hear? Can you guys hear? Okay. Were there any questions or comments uh, related to uh, the topic? So we know the difference between a mudahana wa mudarat. Mudahana, which means to placate somebody's feelings, and mudarat, which means to be cordial with someone in order to bring out the best result in the situation. Um, we understand that Islam does not neglect the person feeling the way that they feel. That your emotion is your emotion. But however, you are responsible for the actions that um, result in those emotions. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, we understand that you are responsible for the actions. Your emotions are your emotions. Your feelings are your feelings. You know what I mean? Islam does not take that away from you. You know, whether it's jealousy, you know, we're not talking about envy. Envy is haram. Envy is haram. To be envious of someone, to want something to be taken away from that person so you can have it all to yourself, that is haram, that's envy. Then there's jealousy, which is stems from a fear of something being taken away from you that you believe is exclusively for you. You know. You're saying, Salam, I don't understand you speak French. Right. But you just typed the whole sentence in English. Any questions? <laughs> regarding the topic or the discussion that we just had. If you post a question that has no relevance, I'm just going to ignore the question. You can post it a million times. I'm not going to respond to it. Eid Mubarak to everyone as well. MashaAllah. Tabarakallah. Any questions related to the topic? Your spouse displays or indicates infidelity. Would you be just if you did the same action? Absolutely not. <laughs> Why would you send yourself to the hellfire because your spouse decided to do that? If you see something done incorrectly. Send the question again. If you see something done incorrectly. The topic is on um, the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, we're coming to a portion of line number four of the dua. Oh Allah, I ask you for the ability to say the truth, whether I'm angry or whether I'm pleased with an individual. We said that anger is an emotion and that you are entitled to your emotion. However, you are not entitled because of that emotion to act indignant or imprudent towards a person. You are still responsible for your actions. However, your emotions are your emotions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لا يجرمنكم شنعان قوما أن لا تعدلوا Do not allow your hatred of a people to cause you to be unjust. Allah addressed us about the injustice. He never said anything to us about the hatred that we feel for people. That's real. That's emotion, hatred, dislike for a person or people. That's real. No one can tell you not to feel like that. Right? But because of that, in spite of that, you should not be unfair or unjust to people because you dislike them. We also mentioned the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where a man, you know, came to visit him and, you know, he said, you know, this person is an embarrassment to his family. And he, you know, basically expressing how his sentiment, how he felt about the person. And then when the person came into his home, you know, he was nice to him. He was cordial with him and, you know. And so we're talking about the difference between being cordial with someone and placating someone's feeling at the expense of your religion. We are not allowed to placate people's feelings, but we are allowed to be cordial with people. You know. The Burkini in France has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. In my opinion, it really doesn't matter, and nor is it going to change anything. What's important is your opinion about it. Your opinion about it should be the only important opinion to you. Mine shouldn't. If you see something done incorrectly as a sister, who should you go to while keeping Islamic etiquette? Uh, that's a little general, a little vague. If you see something done incorrectly, where? With whom? Like, you have to be a little more detailed than that. 
question is very vague. Don't really understand what you mean by if you see someone doing something wrong. Give me an example, a scenario, so I'm clear about what you're talking about. And the hadith of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said that, you know, a prophet from amongst the prophets, he settled in a valley underneath a tree and the ant bit him. And he had the ant brought in front of him and he's told him to set the whole ant house on fire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, he said, you know, Halla, yani namlatin wahida, why didn't you just hold the ant that bit you accountable? And another narration, he said, you destroyed a whole nation of my creation that worshipped me, you know, for, for, for one ant. You know, this is what anger does. It causes you to transgress the boundaries, go overboard, go above and beyond. I mean, it happens in relationships. You're angry, so you want to not just take it out on this person, but you want to harm this person. You know, so, um, you know, if the phone is in my name, I'm taking the phone out of my name and I'm taking the insurance off of my name and I'm doing this and I'm going to do that. You're doing everything that you can possibly do because of some one hurt that you know, you experience, you know what I mean? Like get, you know, get used to it. In a marriage, you're going to be hurt. That That's, you're sharing your life with someone else that grew up different with you, different than you, to have different reference points than you, to have different worldview than you. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you have to learn how to live in cohesion with this person. You know, you know what I mean? Like you're going to be hurt several times. Doesn't mean that every time you get hurt, that, you know, you start to, you know, take what's yours and, you know, become petty about, you know, issues. You know what I mean? Sometimes marriages don't work. It's, it wasn't you. It wasn't him. It just wasn't destined for y'all to be together. And, you know, the circumstances surrounding your divorce, surrounding your separation was just the, the, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed your separation to manifest. But even if those things didn't exist, other things would have existed because you guys weren't destined to be together anyway. The person you start off with in life is not the person that you necessarily end up with. Stop looking for, you know, people to place the blame on. Stop looking for a place to, you know, a proper place for your hurt. Maybe the proper place for your hurt is you. <laughs> Maybe not the other person. Stop trying to make other people responsible for the hurt that you feel. The hurt that you feel, maybe you are responsible for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put somebody in your life you know, you guys were united for a particular time. You had one, two, three, four kids, five kids came out of that situation. Something happened, y'all separated and you moved on. You guys being together wasn't about your longevity. It was about those children that were supposed to be brought out of that situation. And the experience that you were supposed to take with you because every pain that you experience in your marriage is a manifestation of the problems that you need to fix within yourself. Stop looking for somebody else to, to take ownership of your pain and your hurt. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it didn't work. It wasn't meant. <laughs> it wasn't meant to work. We separated. Even if you would have fixed this problem, he would have fixed that problem. It still wouldn't have worked because y'all wasn't just destined to be together anyway. Sisters quarters unkept at the Masjid Islamic class is only offered for brothers um, I mean, you can address those things. There's nothing, you know, um, and there's, there's a way that, that those things can be addressed. I mean, sister's quarters not being kept in an ashid. I mean, you can start by giving sadaqah by just doing it, you know, just, just by doing it. You don't necessarily have to bring it to anyone's attention. If you see something that is messed up, then, you know, maybe you can just take the initiative and go and fix it, you know, and that's your sadaqah, you know, that's your sadaqah. A man came to Imam Malik and, and was, you know, talking to Imam Malik and he was grabbing Imam Malik's beard. And as he was grabbing his beard, which was seen as a sign of disrespect, which is what one of the chiefs of Quraysh tried to do to the Prophet Sallallahu He walked up to the Prophet and started grabbing his beard and Mughira ibn Shuraba said, He said, take your hand off of the beard of the Prophet Sallallahu before you don't have a hand, before I cut that joint off. So it was seen as a sign of disrespect, but he walked up to Imam Malik while he was sitting on the Musalla floor, and he's grabbing Imam Malik's beard like this. And all the while, while he's grabbing Imam Malik's beard, pieces of hair are falling. Imam Malik had his hand like this. So while the guy is grabbing him, Imam Malik is catching the, you know, the hair in his hand because Imam Malik said that he didn't want the hair to get on the masjid floor. You know, tamdif al-musalla, you know, keeping the masjid clean. 
تقبل الله منا ومنكم صالح العمل عيد مبارك ما شاء الله تبارك الله so keeping the masjid clean is actually one of the etiquettes of Islam if you see something on the floor to remove it you know so in keeping with proper manners who should I speak to as a sister probably the the administrative the person or the head of administration if the man of the house doesn't offer salah is it haram to remain married to them no but it's haram to not say anything to him about it it's haram not to make that your jihad to make that your struggle it's haram to sit there and not let him pray and not say anything about it and just give up on the person but that's your struggle that's your jihad allah gave you that situation you know for for you to just get up and pray that's that's easy and if he prayed five times a day your life will be very simple and piece of cake but it's not <laughs> Allah blessed you with a man that doesn't pray. So now that becomes your fitna, your trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ We have made some of you a fitna for others. Why don't you be patient? We have made some of you a fitna for others. Why don't you be patient? That's your trial. That's your fitna. You can easily say, well, I don't want to be patient with this. I am patient with no man that don't pray. I want to call up. I want to divorce. You divorce him. You marry someone else and you get an abuser. <laughs> you know, you remove one problem and then you get another. Like these things you can't run from. I'm, I'm not telling you to stay and be patient with that. I'm telling you to do what you think is best for you. Do what you think is best for you. I'm I'm not a decision maker. I don't you, people, you all are adults. I'm not here to make decisions for anybody. But I'm here to kind of give you another way of looking at the situation from an Islamic standpoint. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test you with something, there's no running away from it. La mafar min Allahi illa ilayhi. There's no running from Allah except to Allah. So you get rid of that problem and then you got a problem that's even worse than him. As the scholars say with, you know, oppressive rulers, the reason why we should not the reason why we shouldn't revolt against, you know, oppressive leaders is because sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places an oppressive leader over a people because that's what they need. That's what they need. People get the leaders over them that they deserve. Right? But if you remove him, then perhaps that person will be replaced with someone that is even worse. And that worse person, that worse leader, will make the previous one look like, well, dang, we should have just been patient with him because now look at what we got, right? Maybe he doesn't pray. Maybe he's a good husband. Maybe he's a good father to the children. Maybe he's a good provider. And maybe his only issue is that he doesn't pray. And while they might be seen big to other people, other people will be speaking from a place of, a place of privilege, Right? Right? I mean, just, just something to think about. Would this be an example of being tested in your deen? Absolutely. To be married to somebody who doesn't pray? Well, Allah, Allah, I, I, I pray that Allah doesn't test me with that. You know, so it doesn't test me with a spouse that doesn't pray. Um, but yes, it is a test. Absolutely. The word cordial and the other word placate. To placate someone's feelings. Placating someone's feelings means that you know something is wrong, they need to be addressed, but instead you laugh with them, you joke with them, you go along with their behavior without saying anything to them out of fear that you might lose their friendship. Or out of fear that, you know, they might think that you're too religious and they don't want to be around you. All right, so you don't say anything. You keep going and you placate their feelings. The other one, to be cordial with someone... <laughs> Is to be nice with to someone with the hopes that you can win the person over so that you can address the behavior. But it's not in a praise word. You're not praising the person. You're not singing their praises. You're, you're cordial with them. Exactly what that word means, to be cordial. To be nice, to be, you know, to be, you know, tolerable, you know, to, to a point, but not. That you're placating the person, you're praising them, you're singing their praises like they never do anything wrong and they're okay, everything is good. Nah, that is haram in Islam. That's haram. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Any other questions related to the topic? You said you had a book coming out on Twitter. What is the title? The title of the book is uh, In the Interest of Love, A Man's Perspective on Having Multiple Wives in Current 
times, in contemporary times. That's the name of the book, In the Interest of Love. Um, hopefully, inshallah, we'll, we'll have the book out uh, around the time of Ramadan. Inshallah, I should be back in America and I should be going from Mashhad to Mashhad pushing the book. Uh, this is basically a book looking at the psychology, psychology of a man who desires more than one woman. Desires more than one woman. This is not. When I looked at a lot of the books on polygyny in the bookstores, from Barnes and Nobles to the Islamic bookstores, I seen that the vast majority of those books were written by women. So it's a very biased view out there about polygyny, and it's rare that you hear a man ink his thoughts about how, um, you know, how and why men desire you know, more than one woman. So I'm looking at it from a psychology perspective, not necessarily ayat, hadith, ayat, hadith. I kind of moved away from the traditional Islamic writing of, you know, ayat, hadith, ayat, point, ayat, hadith, ayat, hadith, point, ayat, hadith. No, 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 no. I'm going into the psyche, the, the, the internal makeup, the internal wiring of a man and why he wants more than one wife. Is it, uh, you know, one of the chapters in the book is, is it even possible for a man to love more than one woman? You know, is it possible for a man to love more than one woman? Um, I also speak about um, what, uh, that men and women are not the same. Just debunking that whole ideology that men and women are the same. Um so many other issues, man, from a more, you know, and then I, I'm also using personal um, personal discussions that I've had with brothers who have given me permission to, you know, include some of those discussions um, in that book, you know, so it, it is real personal. It's a real personal, you know, um, discussion, inshallah, Tada, uh, that I'm hoping that will change, you know, the narrative as it relates to polygyny in America. And it's not, uh, I'm not advocating for it or against it. I'm just stating facts, just stating what it is. Any other questions related to the topic? I think we should have a panel discussion workshop using your book. Absolutely. I'm hoping that it opens that discussion. Did I get your question? What was your question? When I'm answering the question, when I'm talking, I'm not looking at any of the questions that are coming up. So you might have to wait until I finish talking in order. I had three wives at one time. I can definitely relate. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm going in deep. I'm going in deep. I'm pulling out some stuff. I mean, I'm going back to... Even the way that some of us were raised as men, you know, if you grew up and you had an attachment to your mother or there was this, this you know, this detachment from your mother, even looking at the Prophet Sallallahu and looking at his life, you know, he, his mother died when he was six years old, you know, and there was this longing for that mother-son connection, you know what I mean, without a doubt. I go into all of that, you know what I mean, using Islamic, sound Islamic sources. Don't think that the Prophet Sallallahu marrying multiple women was just for the political reasons or just the, you know, the reasons to debunk, you know, what was going on in that society, the status quo. But there was a deeper, deeper meaning behind him marrying multiple women, you know, and it could possibly be that just that that search for that motherly, that motherly attention, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. I, my goal with writing this book is to, you know, is to, for us to change our, our understanding of polygyny, our outlook, our world, our limited view on polygyny. We tend to look at polygyny through the lens of what happens in our lo local masters, our local communities. This bad example, this one good example, these 30, 40 bad examples. No, 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 no. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. People practice polygyny all over the world. I'm right here in the UAE. Polygyny is on and popping right here. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it happens all around the world, and it's not going to stop just because a couple of people, you know what I'm saying, a couple of people had some bad experiences and decide that they're not going to do it. Okay, but that don't mean that polygyny going to stop. 
it's not going to stop. People are going to continue practicing this. This polygyny predated Islam. Islam didn't, you know, didn't make polygyny permissible. <laughs> Sahaba came into Islam with eight, nine wives. The Prophet Wasallam said, choose four and let the other four go. I cite narrations, authentic narrations, where many of the Sahaba came in to take Shahada. And at the time they took Shahada, they had seven, eight, nine, ten wives. This was before Islam. Islam just came to regulate it. Islam didn't permit it. Islam came to regulate it. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, you know, of course, I deal with um, the whole lesbianism and the whole, you know, um, we're going to humiliate men in order to raise the status of women. I have a whole chapter in there about that, you know, and just showing, you know, from and I'm I'm quoting books. I'm quoting well-known authors, both Muslim and non-Muslim, you know, what I mean, Muslim and non-Muslim, you know, so it, it's really going to require, you know, a big cup of coffee and some some time alone to sit down with this with this piece here. And just to really understand, you know, the psychology of men and how we're wired. We're wired totally different, man. Can you have another wife even though you don't have much? I mean, ha not having much is, is, is like beauty in the eyes of the beholder. It's, it's what, what, not having much might be, you know, for one woman and for another woman, not having much might be sufficient for her. It all depends on the person. There's no one standard, you know, one, you know, hard and fast rule as it relates to what is enough to take care of a woman. There's no hard and fast rule for that, which is why the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just leaves it general that, you know, the man can take care of the woman. It's general. These are these are general commandments. You know what I mean? Why? Because they have to be able to be applicable in every time, every place, and to each and every situation. So Allah does not specify. Just like Allah doesn't specify as it relates to, you know, the, the hijab. The hijab is not specified in the Quran. Allah gives you the description of what a hijab, you know, should, what, what the outward of it should the, the serve, the purposes that it should serve. But Allah doesn't give what color, you know, how it should fit, how it shouldn't fit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a description of the hijab. Whatever you have on as a Muslim woman, if the description that you have on of a hijab matches the description of the hijab in the Quran, then you are covered. I don't care what color it is. I don't care what it looks like. You are covered. You are covered. So, I mean, there, there are generalities and there are general rules, general principles in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left general for a reason. Can the desire for more than one wife be the result of a man having more than one personality? Um, I don't know about that. That's 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 a little that's a little deep having more than one personality. Um, but I do cite some of the reasons that would drive a man to have more than one wife. I even take a look at history, you know, going back to the Victorian period, you know, in in Europe and in other places where you know. Um, sexuality in those in those type of environments people were sexually repressed you know see people were sexually repressed and you know where a woman in in the victorian period would be okay with her husband going out and sleeping with you know a prostitute or something like that only to come back home to her to get that out of his system because she knew that he would never marry a prostitute because in their society and in, in, you know in their culture this was unheard of a man would sleep with a prostitute but he would never marry a prostitute and the housewives that knew that their husbands were doing that they didn't really take a big issue with that because there were certain things that those men required from women that these women that were more reserved and you know raised in a certain cultural standard they weren't willing to do so they would much rather their husbands go to you know a house a whore house go get you know, satisfy and come back home. Today, things are changed because today men marry the prostitutes. <laughs> so now that puts housewives in a situation where now they begin to transform themselves into doing the same things that the prostitutes do, which makes the husband look at, right? Makes the husband look at the wife no different than he looks at the prostitute on the street and therefore loses respect for her. You know, it's called the Madonna whore theory. 
which I have a whole chapter where I talk about that. You know what I mean? And it's, it's you know, it, inshallah, you guys will find and read, you know, very interesting. So hopefully, inshallah, um, doing it, we're beginning the editing process of that now. And um, trying to lock down a, a graphic designer so we can get started on the book cover. And then hopefully by around December, uh, inshallah, Tada, we'll start taking pre orders uh, for the book, Be'ithani Lai Tada. Now, inshallah, let me stop here. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at tasliman kithira wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.